Hey, welcome back once again to your favorite podcast each and every week. It's Disruptive AF with myself, Trigger Jordan, and my astute counterpart, Daniel Holler. Hello, my friend. How hey, are you? Um, I'm all right. How are you? Great, great, always great, and always excited about the guests that we bring on here. Because listen, man, we see such a a, a vast spread of such a, not only amazing talent, but people who are incredibly gifted in stepping into the entrepreneurial realm of innovation and thinking. And this week we have none other than the Tom Burden, the CEO and founder of Grit Mat. Uh, Tom, welcome! Look at that, yeah, I'm just excited, <laughs> so excited to have you, man. And Dan, I, I've had uh, the I have the advantage this week because I've gotten to hear a little bit of his background, uh, and it you, we are in for a treat. So, listeners, those of you who are innovators uh, in the Disruptive AF podcast, you're in for a serious treat. Tom, welcome to Disruptive AF podcast. So glad to have you. Yeah, super super excited to be on the show. So, you know, starting off, normally we like to see a little bit about your background. Um, you have a background very much uh, like a lot of us Air Force people. You were an F-16 uh, maintainer for a while. Uh, and the, the thing I love is you're going to get into the story of Grip Mat and, and the challenges and, you know, that transparency of the innovative journey is that the beginning of your company really started from the frustrations you saw as a mechanic, like as an operator there doing, doing the Lord's work on the F-16. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, my background was, was, uh, like you said, F 16, I was national guard for nine years, uh, specifically air national guard. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was working on the Gatling gun of the F 16 and I realized like, there's no real good place to set your tools. Me being the new guy, we're constantly like having to like run up and down the ladder every time we need to set something down. So or you know you're you're or you're having someone stand next to you on a ladder hand you tools so i just felt like it was like a really big annoying waste and and if you've ever worked on the f16 there's specifically the the gun trough that uh they'll take off the panel and set tools inside there which is you know a qa issue and, and it can be a really big fod hazard so um we uh yeah i just at the same time, I was I was going to college using the, uh, my GI Bill and everything, and um, was going for mechanical engineering and, and designed the grip mat. So, pretty cool. So I just I'm like so you were an aircraft mechanic and you were experiencing this issue of just repeatedly seeing people use either really inefficient processes or you know put their tools in unsafe places, right? Um, right. would, like how prevalent do you think those, the, like how prevalent were those behaviors generally? Um, just, do you think that that is just a kind of once in a, once in a while issue or do you, would you say that this is an indicator of a, of a wider trend of just very, uh, kind of low hanging fruit for, for innovators? Yeah. So, so what I see typically within, um, maintainers are kind of tied between like two different issues. One issue is being time efficient with, um, you know, what they're doing. And then the other issue is doing it by the QA book. And those don't always overlap. So, um, you know, do you reduce the, your time of running up and down the ladder by 10, 20% by setting tools inside the jet, by setting tools in your pocket? And, and potentially face the hazard of a QA fail? Or do you, um, you know, not do that and just take on the complaining from your um, supervisor um, uh, because you're, you're performing slowly? Yeah, absolutely. So, no, that sounds like a, that's, that sounds like the, the age old issue between compliance and innovation, right? Is there's always kind of this tension between the two. Uh, so, it's interesting um, that your story includes having to, it sounds like having to go outside of that environment before you were, you were enabled to make this innovation happen. Is that, do, do you think that that was like, what was it, what was it that actually facilitated that, that happening for you? Was it the, was it the uh, entrepreneurial spirit or was it, was there something within the environment that made it impossible for you to make progress? The thing that um, really like pushed me forward was just not really the entrepreneurial spirit 
spirit. It was just like, I was so frustrated with this problem and I felt like it was, uh, I could, I could come up with a simplistic solution. And, um, it's, Honestly, at the time, there wasn't in the Air Force, there wasn't really an avenue to explore new new ideas, um, which is like gets me really excited of, of you know, everything that's going on with AFWorks. Um, a good friend of mine, Joey Aurora, was, you know, pretty, pretty early adopter um, with with AFWorks. So um, he really like showed me what everything about AFWorks and I was like, super excited and um because i was like this is what i wish i had had when then so um yeah it was it was um you know like starting my own company and and doing everything that i've done um wasn't really like like the direction i intended or really wanted to go um i mean there was multiple times of like of like trying to steer away from bankruptcy so um if I could have at the time just like found what I was looking for online and just bought it and then the, we would be done, then that, that would have, that's how I would have done it. Yeah. Um, I wasn't like problem solution, product market fit, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> it wasn't like really that. Oh, the man. And, and, and that's one of the things uh, that I, I remember you'd mentioned mentioning um, when we had the chance to talk earlier was you brought this up to your supervisors. And you, you face what I feel like we all have faced before, where it's like, oh, yeah, that's that's cute. Why don't you just go back to what you're doing? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's like that's cool. Like you're in college, right? That'd be a great college project. And then, um, yeah. So now it's we're past the college project. But, yeah, um, that's well, the answer well, to the question. Yeah. And that's something like when you talk about, uh, and I know the word toxic gets thrown around a lot, but I guess I just, I, I use it uh, not all the time, not as a blanket statement, but people don't realize, leaders don't realize, we don't realize in our own environments how just our our response to even that of saying, hey, yeah, that'd be a good, you know, college project, aren't you? When somebody's trying to bring you a real solution that actually solves an actual problem that they see, for whatever reason, it's like we oftentimes I say we, hopefully we aren't doing it, but in times in industry and even in our own organizations, you see leaders and, and times where it's like, well, yeah, that's not going to work. And they really don't even give it a chance. And that's, if I understand correctly, that's really what launched you into saying, no, there is a solution. And this isn't just a cute side project. Like there's something to this. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I think like a couple issues with the current system is is that, we're dealing with, it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks. So we don't have like the culture of b being like changing or wanting to adapt, which I see AppWorks like having that like very strong in their culture. And then the other thing is um, creating a space for, for mistakes, creating a space to like try new things because I mean, which can definitely be hard when you're, when you're working on a, a fighter jet, like you don't want to like, Hey, let's test out new products where like something could fail. But at the same time, the, the concept of testing, um, like, I was getting all the time, like they're constantly like trying to find rules of how that would, of what that would break. Yeah. Instead of, instead of like, stop like looking for rules to like push this away. Like, let's just try it. And if it works, then we'll figure out, you know, we'll just go from there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's almost like, a... go ahead, Dan. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day who said who who said this exact thing. They were they were like, okay, but how do we create a culture of innovation when innovation can be so dangerous? And my my pushback was, I'm like, I'm not in the I'm not in the maintainer field, right? I'm not in the field where we're dealing with you know pushing buttons and firing off lethal weapon systems or or any of that. But my my sense is that actually a majority of innovation is within like these very almost like mundane interactions you're talking about where to put your tools right also right. another thing that i'm hearing from you is that without that spirit of innovation we were actually putting ourselves more at risk they were uh people were compensating for the inability to innovate by using dangerous practices right. yeah, yeah for and, sure and there's something you'd mentioned um, I think Dan, I think it was maybe a couple of podcasts ago, but this really, 
I'm starting to see it more and more where people look at, at innovation. I've even heard it out of leaders' mouths before where they say, oh, you know, this is going to blow by. This is going to pass over just like, you know, this did and that did. We've seen it before. You just wait it out and it goes away. And it, it, it's this it's this mindset that that, hey, we want to have uh, we want to have, quote unquote, innovation and we want to solve a couple of problems. And then everybody holds up the sign. Oh, mission accomplished. We did it. Great. And I literally just about 40 minutes ago encountered the conversation with somebody where they said, well, you know, now that we got this thing approved, we're probably going to see a downturn in in what you guys need in a spark cell. Right. I was like, no. Not even close. What are you talking about? Uh, innovation is not something you do. It's not. It's not a, a game to be won. You know, Simon Sinek talks about it in his new book, Infinite Game, where a lot of people look at uh, look at innovation as a finite game. You begin it, you end it, you win. It's done. Everybody goes home, and that and that season is over. But to truly be in the mindset, to truly be in the de- in the, in the mindset of iteratively thinking and developing and and questioning and trying and and, and testing and growing. To do that, it's an infinite game. There's no beginning or end. You stay in it. It has to be a process that you're willing to allow to happen, to walk through. And it's an ecosystem you have to build. And I think you're going, Tom, Tom, going back to what you said, I think that's something that's, it just has to start becoming something we realize. The innovation, the entrepreneurial spirit, this this decision space, this decision thinking um, that, Dan, you're, you do such a great job with is, not something you do, you begin and end. It's something that you you create that must go on and stand the test of time if you truly want to see the benefits of it. Yeah. Definitely agree with that. Yeah, I'd say, Dan, that is interesting what you're saying of like, how do you, uh, you know, being innovative can be deadly um, with, you know, dealing with such crazy equipment. But, you know, at the same time, I'm just trying to test out a rubber tray, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. Hey, like, add one more person just to like watch me, <laughs> and then we're done. So, yeah, and I think this is part of the danger of like I'm always railing about the idea that we keep innovation in these isolated spaces, right, away from the rest of the workforce. I think that part of the danger of that is that most of the people within the within the workforce, like the larger body of, of the culture they don't ever get an idea of what we're talking about when we say experimentation. They don't actually get an idea of what we talk about when we say accepting risk, um, because in, in actuality, the, the riskiest thing is to not innovate. Like we're, we, yeah. everything is doomed to fail. Yeah. So if we're not constantly innovating, we're just, we're just edging our way closer and closer to some kind of catastrophe, some kind of situation like COVID-19 that comes up and, and suddenly we're, you know, like caught with our pants down and we can't communicate because we haven't been innovating the way we communicate this whole time, right? Right. Tom, as we're talking about this, this, it, this process of being able to adapt to changes and, and even though you developed one direction, being able to stop, recognize, you know what, uh, this is a sunk cost. We, <laughs> what we're doing right now clearly isn't working. We need to pivot to be able to reattack the actual problem that we're facing right now. Um, there's a couple. Of, there was a couple of key points that, as, as you were talking, uh, really stand out to me. You know, you mentioned something about the point where you had gone bankrupt. You had almost gone bankrupt, and the decisions you had to make to say, okay, like I can't keep doing what I have been doing because it just necessarily hasn't been working. Um, c- right. Can you walk us through just a couple of those quick examples uh, of what that looks like for an individual? Because there's a lot of comparison between you and what you did with Grit Matt as a as a solo dude, and then building a team. Uh, to be able to help you support that. There's a lot of similarities between you and the the venture that people in, you know, in their squadrons or in their wings or in their groups that are going through when they have an idea and they're kind of in this this space where they're like, I've, I've got to make this step, but I'm not sure what I do. So can you can you talk us through a couple of those points, those really keynote points in your life where you're like, dude, this was this was pivotal. If I didn't adjust, I would I wouldn't be here. Yeah. So I would say one of the most important things that I did was um, so being in the Air National Guard, you, if you have a certain job, you can get up to a $20,000 sign-on bonus. So I took all of the bonus, I took all of my basic training money that, that I made, and then all of my tech school money that I made. Um, and when I say all of it, I would say like at least 95% of it. So when I was at tech school, and it's 
you're you're able to like go out to the the mall or anything like i did not spend anything like no one was i had a flip phone i had like the the absolute bare essentials and i took all that money and i ended up buying a house next to the college i was at and i it was four bedrooms and i switched it to six bedrooms so i finished the basement um added two more bedrooms and I was renting out each room for um, to, to other college kids. And with that, I basically had like free, um, like no rent and no bills. And I had an income of a thousand dollars just from that. So what happened was I was also getting money from being in the Air National Guard, which the GI Bill and Kicker was like another thousand dollars after with everything was said and done. So I was able to like use that money to basically like live off of dirt, but um, still work on grip mat. Um, so I was leveraging all the resources from the National Guard, from the Air Force to how I can like, the, the way that I looked at the bonus was that this was, this was like an opportunity that would impact me for the rest of my life. So I was just constantly looking how to like leverage the resources that was given to me from the Air Force in a bigger way. So um, like the, the very like shortest way I could say it is like with the airmen, with, you know, any, anyone in the military is, is like being like financial literate and like, like really understanding finances is, is very important. When I say that, like, it's just very, very basic. Just have like the mindset of when you get a hundred dollars, what like what do you what do you need to to keep living versus i got a hundred dollars like what all can i buy where a, like um someone said it to me earlier the best best way to explain it is a lot of people's mindset they they won't say this or they don't really think this way but their their mindset is a race back to zero so i've got a hundred dollars what can i oh i can get by ear pods i can buy an apple watch i can buy you know, well, I got Netflix subscription. So they're like racing back to zero. So like, if you don't have that mindset of racing back to zero, that is like the very like basic, like foundation before you even go into like wanting to invent a new product because you'll have all these ideas. And if, if you're drowning in debt, like, like there's so many times if, if I was drowning in debt, that was just like one more push, like push down. Uh, there's no way it would have, uh, it would have happened. So, that was very big. And then like another thing I would highly recommend if, if you're very new is like, when I say new, new to creating products is make the prototype yourself. Like whatever you gotta do, like as, as far as you can push that prototype yourself. Cause for example, I, I got a quote for $18,000 to make a, a grip map prototype, which is like looking back on it, I was like, these guys are a ripoff. This is outrageous, but that's like a normal price. That's like a pretty fair price actually. And the the thing is like, so I got that and I was like, there's no way I'm gonna do that. And I ended up making it in my basement for $60. So the thing is when when you like really look into and explore different routes of like, solving the solution. So when I'm saying like a prototype, like what I really mean is an, is like prototype MVP, whatever you want to call it. MVP is most val valuable. Um, what is it? Minimum viable like, product. You know, yeah. Minimum most viable. Viable product. Yeah. Minimum viable product. So basically what's, what's the most sim, like the least amount you can do to get, to explain this product. So, um, you know, if you got a crazy idea of like a new type of like fighter jet or something, like obviously you can't build a prototype of a fighter jet yourself, but like, you know, how can you explain it? And like, ideally, if you can get a prototype yourself, definitely, definitely do it. Yeah. And I think yeah, what that beautiful. equates to a lot is when you have uh, a lot of times when people are thinking about making something, not just even making something, but creating a prototype or trying to show a proof of concept, they get scared away with the requirements of what it's going to be. And it's this, I mean, it could be as simple as cardboard and duct tape to be able to show, yeah. show what it is. Like, it doesn't have to be, oh, I can literally use this right now. And a lot of times I've seen that literally as a barrier of entry for people to even start this process of getting started because they're like, well, I have to show my show my leadership a finished product. No, you don't. 
No, they just they just want to see what you're talking about. They want to see a basic idea of what that looks like. And so many times we get wrapped around the axle. That's um, oh, no, wild. I was just hey, going to say, like, um, it sounds like you were, for this specific problem, you were, op like, optimally positioned to be the creator of the minimum viable product. Um, I think that yeah. a lot of people think a little too far outside of their zone of of influence and and it, and a lot of innovation you you know that is just kind of within arm's reach to to be a little bit too on the nose about it i guess yeah yeah real quick i'd, I'd say like why that is so important is that um to do it yourself is that you're going to naturally simplify it as much as possible so all the bells and whistles that and all these crazy features like you're going to simplify it as much as, pro as possible. And then it's also going to be like easier to communicate with your, with whoever you're pitching it to or showing it to. So it's just like, this is just a rubber tray, hold your tools, not a so rubber tray with say, yeah. into it or like a yeah. RFID to track it. Like that's the ideas I get. Like I, yeah. I still can't do the RFID thing. It's, you know, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It sounds like you didn't start with the 5g model. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. yeah. Definitely not. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, well, we're going to cut away to break real quick. Make sure you hit the subscribe button right over there and the bell to get notifications for your favorite content right here on Disruptive AF. Or if you're listening anywhere podcasts are available, make sure you follow and subscribe as appropriate. And we'll be right back with Tom Burton, the CEO and founder of Gripmat, right here on Disruptive AF. Are you listening to this podcast and wondering what you should do to get started? Join AppWorks weekly office hours call to hear about different resources and programs available to you and the rest of the defense innovation community. Tune in at the link in the show notes every Monday at 1 p.m. Central to hear more. Hey, welcome back to uh, Disruptive AF Podcast here with my good friend Trigger Jordan. And we're talking to Tom Burton, who's had just a, a really interesting journey as a creator and innovator, uh, both inside the Air Force and as, a, as an entrepreneur on the outside now with GripMat. And we talked a little bit about the the originating kind of like the the journey that you went on with discovering that you had this issue and you know talked a little bit about the process of making an mvp can you go into from that point like i think there's a lot of people who have that seed of an idea and they might understand even how to create that initial prototype or that initial you know like mvp to to try and prove yeah. the concept but that's not really enough is it to just to, to like have an idea or even like the best product ever can you talk a little bit about the journey to getting buy-in from like pitching to understanding how, like what you have to do to reach the people who could make these innovations happen. Yeah. So the like very, very really ground level idea, like step, very, very first ground level step would be um, doing what's called getting customer contacts. So if you look at what's called the business model canvas by Steve blank, um, I, I like, did this the business model canvas so much where the core of it is is about getting like customer feedback where you know the thing is what happens all the time with entrepreneurs that they think they know this the they think they know the problem and they think they know a solution where if you start getting customer feedback um you can really see like where it's ranking on on the problem list so like for example if i'm gonna like talk about grip map with um, and uh, someone, someone who's working on a car, automotive, um, if I, instead of saying, hey, do you think you could use this? Saying something like, hey, what's, what's the top three issues with working on a car? And then they might say something completely irrelevant. Or, you know, if I'm trying to guide them down, like more of a path, be like, hey, what's, what's the biggest issue when you're working underneath the hood of a car? Or how often do you lose tools? Um, so, so asking like these very broad questions, because sometimes if you, if you ask enough people and you're seeing, you know, the direction going in like a pattern going in a certain way of like, well, everyone's having issues with the 
the back right tire of a Honda, whatever it is, um, then you potentially could could solve that that issue. So that's that's very important um, when you're dealing with specifically the military. There's a term called customer archetypes that's going to be very important when you're, especially if you're wanting to do what I'm doing, which is like selling to the military. So customer archetypes is that you have a buyer and then you have someone who, so you have the user and then you have a buyer. It's a different person. So, and then you will lay out every single like step of that. So you have a buyer who's an, who's an influencer to that buyer, who's, you know, is there the final decision maker is so like, for example, if you think of if you're selling video games to children, they don't buy it. Who yeah, buys yeah. it? That's you know, there's point. so like, who's the influencer? Well, the influencer is little Johnny went over to Eric's house and Eric has the game. Little Johnny wants the game. Who makes the decision? Let's say it's a, it's a, it's a, um, stay at home mom, the mom makes the decision. Well, who's like paying for it? Yeah. You know, if the dad, you know, so that like the dad doesn't really know or care, but if mom says yes, then they just, okay, yeah, here, you just do it. So yeah. like understanding that whole like system is very important with the military. So like, just keep that in mind where, you know, people who are listening also, there's, I, I've, I've noticed like working with AFWorks, um, you know, doing the whole, be, like seeing Spark Tank and everything is, the, I, I've seen like two different styles of of people who want to create solutions. There's the solution maker who wants to start a company, um, and then there's a solution maker who um, wants to, like they're in the Air Force, they want a solution in the Air Force, and um, they just want to like continue their job. They're just trying to solve this problem for themselves and and airmen alike. So. Um, the thing is the customer archetype system might not be as important if you're if you're like i'm just trying to solve this for myself and custom and airmen and the like now it, it will be to a point where like of like who do you need to influence and talk to in order to like get this ball rolling so it, it's not going to be the customer archetype your customer archetype system is not going to be focused on just sales it's going to be more focused on like implementation so um it, does that make sense no, that makes absolute sense, and it's it's a yeah. really interesting problem within the military because, like, so within the within the private sector, you have to worry about business viability. Like, you have to worry about is this going to continue to you know, you don't produce something just because it produces value in the commercial sector because if it doesn't also make money, then it's not you're not going to survive, right? You can't just continue right. to build something that's losing you money. You're not a viable business. In the military, we have a different issue from from what I've seen, which is that um, a lot of the a lot of the adoption of things is not reliant on the customers themselves getting value from it. It's from their leadership telling them to use it, or it's from their you know, yeah. like that. Like it's really important that their leadership is convinced that this is going to produce value for the mission, not necessarily for the users, which is. You know, I, I have mixed feelings about that because I think that we should be very concerned about the user experience of people at ground level. Um, and the Air Force has kind of gotten on board with that more recently with like we've stood up the uh, the chief experience officer is a position now in the Air Force and he's looking at user experience. But But then also I see a lot of innovations come out that are being pushed out for their feature set and it's like if it has all the features we need it's probably the right solution without worrying about these these issues that you're talking about which is adoption and buy-in um, and those are so important to consider as we're trying to develop these products so i can you talk a little bit about your journey of of just specifically with the with the product grip mat what what you had to go through with you, you talked about a little bit about user research and doing interviews the right way um, and mapping things out on, on like Steve Blank products. Uh, all of those can be found at strategizer.com, I believe is, is a really good research right. for that stuff. Nice. Yeah. He, yeah. So the I core program um, it has, it it's trains these things out. Um, cool. if actually, if people are interested in, in getting into these facilitated frameworks, it's something that we're doing with Agitare. So agitare.org. 
um, is we're trying to get those things, those exact things that you're talking about out to airmen to understand how to facilitate user discovery and stuff like that. But um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about your path, like how you found your way to to like the, these products, like the business model canvas or the customer archetypes or those things that you found on the outside and brought into your process? Yeah, so I started applying to a lot of, a lot of grants. Um, so through the grant process, typically what they would do is um, to start people out, they would, they would say like, do an X number of, of um, customer contacts and then we'll give you a certain amount of money. So they'll, they'll accept so many companies and, and have a amount of money like delegated for that, those entities. Um, and then they'll take you through a process and once you hit certain benchmarks, um, then they would delegate the, the cash. So um, for me, I mean, <laughs> they were like, hit X number amount of customer contacts, it will give you money. I'm like, I will hit that tomorrow. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't care if it's a thousand, but I will find a way to do it. Kinsley, you were talking about um, like sharing ideas. Um, I get asked a lot of like, or I hear people talk about like, do you share your ideas or, you know, because someone might rip you off or someone might be negative. Um, I always say like, when in doubt share, because the thing is if like sometimes, I've had my own cousins be afraid to share with me because they didn't have it patented yet. They're like, well, I don't want it to get stolen. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drop everything I'm doing to steal from you. The thing is, if, you, if I don't know, I can't help you. Like yeah. I could easily, like the other day, someone told me that they wanted to get, they had like a, a realtor idea. And I'm like, oh, my buddy who I'm like staying with here is into, and is into, you know, doing real estate. And so it was like an easy, quick connection that would have never happened if, if I didn't know. So, yeah. but the thing is you get feed when, when, when you share your idea, just step one, like do not take the feedback personal and step two, think of where you're getting the feedback. So um, if you're, if you're in a toxic negative environment, like don't be surprised if you get negative feedback on anything, yeah. you know, you could yeah. be like, Hey, I got, you know, uh, I got, you could say, I got a parking ticket. I got an A plus on an exam. I got a new idea and all three could be very negative in, in certain situations. Honestly, like uh, I was weapons and there's a lot of like neg the, the environment can be very harsh there. So like, don't, don't take it yeah, personally yeah. when you pitch an idea and someone's like, dude, you're dumb and yeah. like, doesn't even look at it. So don't be like, man, am I really dumb? I yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, like there, there, is, there was this yeah. last week. I, I, I uh, for my, for my own personal business, I, I love Shackleton's quote where he put it out there. He, he just like laid it on the line. He said, "Listen, if you're interested in a, a long, a long journey that is arduous, dangerous, freezing cold, low wages, and you yeah. may not survive, uh, apply." <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And so I, I did that recently because I'm looking to hire some additional people on, a, on my, uh, uh, my business on the side. And I put it in this academy. Um, I'm an Air Force Academy grad. I put it in this academy venue where it's like, uh, hey, ask, offer. It's a face, a private Facebook group. And I put it in there knowing that people are just going to be savage. They're going to be like, oh, who's this idiot? I can't believe blah, 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 blah. But the amazing thing is, is, and they did exactly what I expected them to do. You know, a majority of people are like, oh, what an idiot. I can't believe we posted. But, but 10 people reached out to me in a direct message and said, hey, man, like I'm really interested in what, like this sounds really intriguing can we set up a meeting to talk? And those are the people I'm looking for. So as, as innovators and entrepreneurs, man, I don't care what the, let the dude, let the, let the squawker squawk. That's all they do. That's all they're ever going to do. They're all their job is just there to squawk and try to be normal and try to live a normal life. But innovators, entrepreneurs, we weren't made to be normal. Like stop trying to fit into the crowd. You already, you, you are different to begin with. Otherwise you wouldn't have these drives to fix the problems that you have in your life. Yeah. And, and also with that, like with, with sharing, there's a the fear of like uh, someone stealing it. Um, I, I would highly recommend like, so the thing is, if you've never had an, a new idea or never pursued like a, an invention or something, like just share because people are most likely not like hiding in the bushes, listening to your amazing ideas and like running away and going to go steal them. So now the thing is after your first or second like success of a new idea, then like reconsider how you're sharing, who you're sharing to. 
Yeah. You know, if you're share, if you're brainstorming with a, another company who could be a potential partner or might take a take your idea like that, you know, down the road is when when you'll be, you know, it's more important. But when when you're amongst like friends and family or like the general public, um, I definitely definitely share. Yeah. Hey, we just have just a couple minutes real quick to be able to wrap this up into it. But it's amazing how fast our time goes when we when we're talking about stuff we're just crazy passionate about. Um, if we had one thing, we're just going to go around the horn real fast. If we had one thing that you could send people out the door of the Disruptive AF podcast with that you want them to know about your innovative journey or, or any uh, piece of information where you'd say, dude, you need to know this. Dude, you need to know this. Tom, what is that for you? Yeah, I would say the one thing. That's that's big. I would say the one thing is um, no pressure. <laughs> hands down, like, definitely being persistent. Um, you know, a lot a lot of times there's like a misconception of the, the or there's like there, there's thousand percent misconception of an of an overnight success. So um, overnight success usually takes like at least three to ten years. So uh, just keep that in mind. Being persistent. Um, you know, being passionate is very important um, to to when you hit those rough times. So uh, persistence is key for sure. That's huge. Dan, your parting shot. Hearing just the basic idea that um, the, it was it is more dangerous to kind of maintain the status quo. Sometimes yeah. it's more dangerous to let that need for compliance dictate how we behave rather than really questioning whether there's an important value that we need to be bringing to the, to the, uh, to the environment. The other thing that I wanted to, to just kind of foot stomp again is this idea of customer discovery. It's not something that we've really gone to in depth in previous episodes, but it is such an important thing to understand. It also aligns really well with, like I, like I said, my, my latest project, which is just trying to get those facilitated customer discovery skills and the understanding of those, of those, uh, templates and tools like the the business model canvas or the mission model canvas in, in the military context a lot of times uh, customer archetypes and 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 like knowing where to reach out to if you if you want to start doing user discovery you want to start doing customer discovery um, like we're we're trying to get those skills out to airmen um, and and there's it's not as I, th I think that Tom did a good job of kind of describing why it's not as straightforward as you would think. Like some the the kinds of questions that you need to prepare for users are never just would you use this or do you think that this would produce value for you. It's it, like people are very bad at predicting what their behavior is going to be. So yeah, it's uh it, it's really useful to have a good coach or a good resource. Uh, and we have those in the Air Force, and we're we're building up a community to try and make those accessible to airmen. So, I like I've gotten a lot of this, and and I'm I'm very impressed with what you've done, Tom, and uh, and it's been just a real pleasure to talk to you. Hey Dan, real quick, I, I really like what you're saying about like um, it's almost dangerous to not innovate. I, I feel like a lot of times in my situation, people were kind of like looking at the potential future hazards instead of like the current hazards. Yeah. So, you know, when you're showing off your idea or pitching your idea, just keep that in mind of that people will see something and they'll think of like the, the, the future hazards, like, like the grip mat, someone said, well, oh, you can't send anything on the, on the jet when you're working. I'm like, but right now we're facing the hazard of setting things inside the jet. Yeah. So like, you know, just keep that in mind when you're weighing that out, because mm -hmm. a lot of times people would say, you know, oh, there's a future hazard, can't do it. Where it's like, hold on, it's it's not, is there a future hazard? It's, we have to weigh out the future hazard versus the current hazard. So just to dig into that a little bit, one thing, like we've talked a little bit about storytelling in the past and, and one important part about getting that buy-in is telling the right story. And one really great story that everybody can tell with their current situation is what are the, what is the hazard that we're facing right now? What is right in front of us? Rather than just like a lot of people look at an innovation and they're like oh that's a nice to have really be able to tell the story of why right now what we're doing is hurting people or it's hurting the mission or like that's a that's such a key component to to a pitch i think yeah for sure kinsley what was yours oh man oh goodness put me on the spot um when we were it's talking so about, huh yeah, me? Gosh, no way. Um, man, when, 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 
when we're talking about having to uh, not only dive in, dive into the mindset of this is going to be hard, this is going to be a challenge, but you know, people are going to dog on it. That's fine. That's what this space is. And I know sometimes it's really hard, especially if you have an introspect, an introvert that says, "I don't want to, I don't want to deal with this outside pressure." It's scary to launch yourself out there. It's scary to go to somebody and say, "Hey, this is my this is my idea." Because you're not just taking an idea, you're not just taking the widget. You're you're really taking a piece of you, a piece of your thought, of your ingenuity, and presenting it to somebody for them to potentially destroy and crush. And when they say no, they're not just saying no to the idea; they're saying no to your thought process. Is what I think a lot of people uh, they look at that and they say, "I don't want to put myself out there," but you have to. You have to. It's only going to pay dividends. And and like you've mentioned before, Tom. Um, it, success is on the other side of failure. At times, you're going to have to go through a failure. You're going to have to go through those, those times. And we didn't even get to the chance to, to talk about the part of the story where you m sold your house, moved into your car, you're in your car, almost went bankrupt. I mean, to be able to make it happen. And that's what people forget. They think innovation or entrepreneurship or starting or putting yourself out there is going to be easy. It's not. Except the fact now it's going to be hard. People are going to, to ridicule you for your idea and putting yourself out there, but there is the hope on the other side that you have in, you, in this space, in AFWorks and AFVentures, in these places that we work, there are people who are like-minded who want to help you through this process. And that's exactly why we do this podcast. Thanks for asking, Tom. Seriously, I appreciate that. Dan never asked me what I think. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Dude, he always does. I just rattle it off. Dude, man, that's why that is exactly why we have amazing guests like you right here on Disruptive AF Podcast is because we want people to know that there are entrepreneurs, there are entrepreneurs, there are innovators out there, Dan, and we cannot let people just lie in the rut of normalcy because normal is toxic to me. That's my new statement. I don't want to be normal. I don't want to stick to normal. Normal is toxic you, to me. You don't have a lot to worry about. I know. I know. That's fair. Okay, guys. Well, hey, that wraps up this week's edition of Disruptive AF Podcast. Again, make sure you subscribe. Uh, if you're watching YouTube, the button right over there and make sure you hit the notifications as well as following us wherever Spotify, wherever Spotify, wherever podcasts are available, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, which whatever you're watching on, make sure you subscribe and we'll catch you next time right here on Disruptive AF.